channel is called From New York to Taiwan, Occupy Movements and Anti-Globalization. So we have the pleasure today to have uh, Huang Yufen and Wei Yang uh, come all the way from Taiwan to tell us um, their first-hand experiences in the Occupy Congress movement there <laughs> from Taiwan. And I think um, a lot of us here um, came to the panel because we want to met them, but also uh, we want to use this opportunity in New York and to think about how um, the Occupy movement in Taiwan is actually linked to the movements abroad in, in New York and thinking about uh, the broader dynamics of capitalist globalization and how um, the Taiwan's movement is part of an enactment of that. So we have um, invited seven panelists and uh, professors and activists uh, from New York City to really thinking about how can we develop global strategies against um, capitalist globalization. And we are live streaming it, so uh, there's a lot of techie things going on. Um, and, if you're, and we're going to take um, a short, um, so we'll, because of time constraints, we probably won't have break time in this three hour panel. Um, so if you feel like you want some snack and coffee, um, just please um, feel free to go. All right, so we're going to start with um, Yufen first, and she's going to tell us a little bit um, about um, the movement in Taiwan as a whole. So, okay. thank you. Let's welcome her. Announced in 30 seconds that the Cross Strait Service Trade Agreement, CSSTA, has been reviewed by the Joint Committee when other legislators were battling for voicing their opinions. The news enraged all NGOs and student associations that have paid close attention to this trade pact. Nobody can foresee that this trade agreement, which lacks supplementary measures, risk evaluation, and public support, would be passed in such an absurd and undemocratic way. Before the CSTA was introduced to the legislative yuan, Taiwan's Congress, the signing procedure had been done. Therefore, as soon as Zhang Qingzhong's announcement is ratified, the trade agreement will proceed to the next stage and, will, and be promulgated immediately. Soon, the CSTA will be given a legal ground, even though it is negotiated, signed, and reviewed in an utterly undemocratic way. In fact, an, an opinion poll showed that about 75% of people agreed on a clause-by-clause -clause review of the trade agreement. Um, so That's the darkest day of Taiwan's democracy from my perspective. The legislatures who are supposed to speak for the public only follow the command of President Ma ying who is also the leader of KMT. The KMT legislators ignored most Taiwanese people's opinions, broke the cross-party agreement of reviewing the trade pact on a clause-by-clause -clause basis, and scheduled a vote for the trade pact as a whole. What happened in front of us is a, is a dysfunctional representative democracy that is incapable of overseeing the executive power. It's hard to believe that these politicians don't care about how most Taiwanese people's lives will be changed, what the future of Taiwan will be, and what Taiwanese people are considering. They care nothing except the government business relationships between Taiwan and China. So we can see from the map, the square represents the legislative yuan. The north uh, is the Zhongshan South Road, and the west is the Qingdao East Road, and on the left one is the Jinan Road. Um, so in order to protest the undemocratic 
procedures of the CCSTA. Some NGOs decided to hold a gathering outside the legislative room. In the evening of March 18, meanwhile, some students, associations, and NGOs decided to take action to express our demands. Through a six-hour-long discussion and labor division, around 9 p.m., an NGO called Alliance of Refer Referendum for Taiwan started to strike the front door uh, of the le legislative room as a cover. At 9.05 p.m., the crowd on Jinan Road initiated another strike to distract police attention. And then, around 9.15, 50 students broke the side door on Qingdao East Road and occupied the legislative room. It is the first time in Taiwanese history that citizens broke into the legislative room and occupied it. Before the occupation, police and students had intense pushing and shoving at the same time, through spreading information on the internet, more and more students and citizens gathered on the road and so eventually torn down the side door um, to sit in, in the legislative room. If we say that on the 3rd of May, the court of law can be said to be proven to be the possibility of So during the sitting, there were many classes and public speeches delivered on the street around the legislative room. While we saw the possibility of fighting for freedom on March 18th, five days later we witnessed revival of an authoritarian state violence. Since the occupying started, about 10,000 uh, people had sit in on the streets surrounding the legislative room. On March 22nd, Prime Minister Jiang Yihua paid a visit to protesters, but didn't respond to the demands of this, uh, this movement. Next day, in an international press conference, President Ma ying still avoided answering protesters' demand. Not satisfying with the ignorance of Ma's administration, Around 7 p.m. of March 22nd, uh, 23rd, people began to march to the executive yuan. Thousands of people broke into and occupied the executive yuan. They sat in there, hand in hand, saying, Without, uh, withdraw the treaty, demand democracy. After a three-hour peaceful sitting, riot police started to evict the crowd around midnight. Many nonviolent and unarmed citizens were attacked by batons, high-pressure water cannons, and tear gas. At that night, Taiwanese government employed extreme state violence to suppress protesters. It made us realize that the authoritarian regime is never gone. Many people think that the action of occupying the executive yuan obfuscates the focus of the whole movement. However, the demands and contents of this anti-CSSTA movement are complex and multifaceted. We occupy the legislative yuan to condemn the undemocratic procedures to sign and, of signing and reviewing the CSSTA. But the structural factor beyond behind the undemocratic procedures is that the executive power prevails the legislation, and the legislation fails to oversee and balance the executive power effectively. Therefore, it is legitimate to occupy both the executive yuan and the legislative yuan. Instead of saying that the, the action of occupying the executive yuan obfuscates the demands of this movement, it's better to say that the action stands for the demands of the whole sunflower movement. So on 
March uh, 30th, uh, over 500,000 people demonstrate up in front of the presidential office to show the support of Sunflower Movement. So over the past 23 days, we have experienced, we have tried deliberate democracy on the street. We launched citizen classes and public lectures on the street. And we try to um, get more citizens involved uh, in this movement. And last Monday, uh, the leader of the legislative Yuan, Wang Jinping, visited students occupying the legislative Yuan and promised that he will not negotiate, uh, we will not host the cross party negotiation until the, the month. Monitor. Monitor, okay, the monitor no. law <laughs> passed. And many people occupied the Congress. We have to say that over the past six months, Ma, the Ma administration continued to not to respond to our concerns and our demands. That's why we have to uh, protest on the street and uh, take this action to uh, express our concerns. And we believe that through this movement, we have consolidated all Taiwanese into this um, action. And we would like to expand our practice and our um, and continue to monitor and oversee the, this CSSTA after we left the legislative UN. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> We know now they have a very, very intense schedule, so, um, and they have a flight to catch, so uh, we're trying our best really to organize here. And next one we have uh, Professor Rebecca Carr. Uh, Rebecca Carr is an associate professor at, of history and East Asian studies at New York University. She's the author of Mao Zedong and China in the 20th Century World and Staging the World of Chinese Nationalism at the Turn of the 20th Century. She's also a co editor of Rethinking the 1898 Reform Period. Political and cultural change in late Qin China and Marxism beyond Marxism. So let's welcome her. Uh, thanks. It's really a true honor to be here, and I don't know why I am, uh, because I really um, have not been involved in this particular movement, although I'm involved in many other kinds of movements, um, particularly movements that happen at NYU. Uh, and uh, that are uh, against uh, the NYU expansion um, uh, across the world, the NYU Imperium. Um, but that's, uh, we're, we're, we won't talk about that right now, um, but uh, just in response to uh, uh, something that was just said, why should Congress be occupied? And it seems to me that Congress, uh, when Congress is not occupied by those who respond to their electorate, then the electorate has to reoccupy their own spaces. Congress is your own space. You should occupy it. And so it's really not an occupation. It's a, it's a, it's a possession. You're taking possession. Um, and, uh, and so on. And, and so one of the things that arises, uh, for me here at least, is what is the role of students or, uh, in politics? And I know that uh, the, the, the movement has run a little bit far from being labeled a student movement. And I want to uh, put forward an idea for why you should embrace being a student movement without, however, letting the idea of student contain you. Because that's, of course, when they say student movement, they wish to contain the movement into you're just students. But we're all students. We all need to remain students. And so the student movement is a movement of society broadly, and it is a social movement that should be embraced. And so we have to understand the relationship of student to neoliberal, to the neoliberal reorganization of the production of knowledge, of activist potentials, and of politics in general. Uh, and it seems to me that there's no possibility of mounting a counterforce to neoliberal uh, uh, values and neoliberal procedures uh, and the neoliberal reorganization of our world unless our educational institutions are occupied and taken over 
and unless our organs of state politics are occupied from within. And I think that that's one of the things that this movement, in conjunction with the Occupy movements around the world, have really shown. Uh, and that they, uh, they, and that they seem to be ephemeral. They come, they go, they're suppressed, they move on, but they move to different parts of the world. And that's what is so beautiful about them, is that they continue, uh, and not as a repetition, but as a, uh, not in that Marxist sense of a farce and a tragedy, but in a constant repetitive movement of growth and of uh, creativity. And I think that's really what the Sunflower Movement has shown us, uh, the creativity of, uh, of students. Because the students uh, are not merely students, of course. They are students but they are not merely students. Um, and as I just said, an, a, an attempt to contain the movement as a student movement is an attempt to contain it socially, politically, and generationally. This, we've seen it happen over and over again in the UK when students came out and protested educational reorganization and the reorganization of funding. That wasn't merely a student movement, that was a movement about the future of education and so it wasn't merely generational that was cross-generational we saw it in Tiananmen in 1989 when that was called a student movement of course it was a student movement it was also a worker movement it was also a civilian movement it was a huge social movement uh, we've seen it repeatedly in Egypt other places okay so that um, it seems to me that embracing being a student means embracing being a citizen of a broad social movement, uh, being a, uh, a, it's sort of like saying a revolution is merely proletarian. Um, we know that the proletarian revolution is the revolution, okay, <laughs> so on some level, and so, or that a revolution is merely peasant, okay, it's, these are, these are, these are attempts to contain the meaning, the significance, okay, and so it seems to me that student has to be embraced and enlarged as a social potential for politics, as a social potential for occupation of time and of space. And I think that student now is a broad designation. Um, if we look at it historically, of course, uh, in the Chinese case, let's say, student uh, in, the, in, the, in the May 4th period burst forth as a, as, a, as, a, as a social category. But ever since that time, student has grown to embrace and encompass larger and larger parts of society. And I think then that when we ask the question of what does neoliberal trade and student, what do these have to do with one another, it's quite obvious. Students are, um, are the ones who are able to produce a certain, kind of, um, a certain kind of analysis and a certain kind of motivational and mobilizational energy uh, to uh, contest the world as it appears and the world as it seems to believe it must be. Um, we deal with this at NYU, and here I'll circle back to uh, our NYU Imperium, um, in, uh, uh, when uh, we try to teach our students or when our institution tries to teach our students that cultural sensitivity has to substitute for politics. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cultural sensi culturally sensitive. I'm just saying that cultural sensitivity is not the same thing as politics. And we say, OK, in Shanghai, let's say, in NYU Shanghai, we can't say certain things. We're not allowed to teach certain things because we have to be culturally sensitive to the Chinese. Well, that's bullshit, OK, <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly, OK? That is politics, okay, and that is politics, and we students and teachers have to call it for that. In the same way where neoliberal trade calls the freedom to trade and accumulate, that that substitutes for all freedom. That is the definition of freedom. We have to say no, that's not freedom. We have to have the freedom to define and redefine the political and the commercial beyond the procedural norm uh, and towards a substantive area of finding and seeking social justice. 
And so if students as members of society do not take the lead in occupations, do not link up with other social constituents, do not become vocal producers of a new uh, political knowledge and political modes of being in the world and uh, new political possibilities, it's very hard to see where the energy and mobilizational creativity might come from and where the occupation of the spaces that are the proper places for democratic politics uh, to be truly democratic, it's hard to see where all of that might come from. Okay, and so I think that the um, occupation of the legislative buildings this time is, uh, is, was a brilliant and creative symbolic move and it was a move that is uh, not only the first time in Taiwanese history, but it seems to me if we look at recent occupations of political or social space, um, it is the first time where that sim the symbolism of the people reoccupying their, their own uh, or places where democracy is supposed to work uh, has, has, has uh, taken place in such a public forum and in front of such a global audience. And so I applaud all of you and am uh, in awe of all of you who uh, have taken part in this. Thanks. thankful for all the panelists who responded to our very last demands to come here and you know, tell us all these beautiful words. Um, so next we have, actually we have uh, Professor Xinhua Shen from Taiwan as well. Uh, she is an associate professor at the Institute of Sociology, National Tsinghua University uh, in Taiwan, where she has been teaching since 2006. She is also a faculty member of the Center for Contemporary China at the university. Her areas of teaching and research are migration, gender studies, masculinities, the sociology of intimacy, and everyday life of social class. Let's welcome her. Thank you. I uh, want to say uh, I'm so proud of my students. They are my students. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, social movement, you have to come to Tsinghua to understand why so, <laughs> so many students got involved into uh, Taiwan's uh, activism. And you know, I will tell you why later if you are interested. So today, I think I'm going to try to focus my time, try to do a little bit, because the topic is about activism in Taiwan, I mean, the global content. So I'm going to say a little bit about uh, a little bit history and then more concentrate on this and I see what's the social political content of these movements. So, I mean, the social movement in Taiwan activism in contemporary term, I mean, so much, you know, have a long term, and especially 80s and 90s. So the period of time, if we look at the period of time, the social content, by then, Taiwan is in the process of form an industrial society, going through a post-industrial society, which means, you see, in the 1980s, a lot of Taiwanese factories, manufacturers, have gone overseas. So Taiwan gradually in the process become a you know service uh, primary, you know, dominated, you know, now so called post industrial society. Uh, it's the whole this in the eighties this uh, process. So in the process we see in the eighties and nineties the movements emphasize on localization or Taiwanization, Zai Di Hua, Taiwan Hua. So the whole idea the the domestically it's more about domestic a politics in the sense by then China is not, uh, wasn't significant enough yet. Uh, and then so it's more so much about the KMT's authoritarian regime. And so that's a process, that's part of it. And then you have uh, all sorts of movements. And I, I got involved in 90s movements before I came overseas to study. I was in five years activism there uh, during a period of time. So that's a different. So by then, was. It's turn of force is in America I can't watch out to Taiwan's democratization process. So you see the difference by now. Uh, and then you go to the nineties, mid nineties to twin two thousand, mid two thousand, this period of time, people would say it's kind of decline of uh, Taiwan means Taiwan's uh, you know social movements in the island in, uh, yeah, in the country. But but it's not so so much decline according to my understanding. It's so much institutionalization of Taiwanese activities because the uh, PT, uh, DPP, the Min Jindang, was in power for eight years. So a lot of you know the activists were walk into the institution. A lot of my friends all over 
different uh, movements, they work closely with the government. And then we come to this wave. This wave is so much, I think, uh, uh, so much, I mean, you know, activism, civil society in Taiwan is, I mean, upside and down, but they never disappear. And I think they come back, uh, I think, especially after 2008, because all this, uh, you know, financial crisis hit Taiwan pretty hard. And in here, I'm going to say a little bit here, what's the major part? I think if the 80s, 90s, it was much more domestic politics about Taiwanese identity, you see then it's a, the issue is a sovereignty issue too. Uh, it's the environment also stuff. So by then the issue also nationalism, and all that kind of social justice. But you now you see it's the same type of issue, not the same type of issue, the same issue is still Taiwanese nationalism as a social scientist. But you see the environment have an external force have changed a lot. For instance, right now we are forcing China, I mean, Taiwan have formed an industrial society now, society has become post-industrialized. So it's a post-industrial society, which means I, I just say, really heavily depend on the service industry. But then this time we are going to sign this uh, service trade pact with China. And that's why it have attracted so much attention because that's related to a lot of people's everyday life, how you survive and make a live. So that's one major. The other is so much about it. externally, China has become such, such big power now. Uh, and then here, I'm going to focus my talk here is about, in my, I, I'm personally, I'm my, my, I have this, my, for my dissertation, I've been doing the research about Taiwanese business people in China. So I have gone to China since my dissertation research this about Taiwanese business people and the relationship in the local, and then the whole idea, the, the literature talking about this globalization, uh, transnationalism, one major power is transnational cooperation. And the, in the, the transnational cooperation, so one major is the transnational capital class. When we call them transnational capital class, not only from traditional Marxist, talking about, you know, we say capital class, in that kind of, restricted kind of region definition you mean the people have, have capital, you know, economic capital. But here the trend, the definition is so much is it's bent to now on the so one is they are only not only economically, they are not only have economic power in terms of they are invested. But also include the politicians, include the uh, social medians, cultural work elites, uh, professionals, high ranking professionals. So that's one. So people, you know, when we talk, talk about uh, this transnational capitalist class, we are talking about you are not only economic power, but they are also the political power elites. They are also the cultural elites working together. So you can see it right now in Taiwan. And they are not only from local one place, they are coming from trans, transnational. So now in Taiwan's case, since the 80s, we have a lot of Taiwanese, I'm sure you know, your parents might be one of them, have gone to China to invest to work. And so the whole this process we see cross straight. This so called, you know, some people of course will question me if are they transnational, right? Taiwan it's Taiwan a country? Uh uh. So <laughs> uh, but they are transnational, right? Uh, so we see this Chinese side and Taiwanese side. And I think that's really major difference. Right now the the Taiwan's the activism, social movement movements we have to face. The so strong not only from China, but we are the China force worked really closely, worked really well with our business people, with our politicians, with our mass media. Zhong Tian, you know, <laughs> the, all this, uh, you know, Zhong Guo, all these kind of uh, media elites. So these class have a great influence in Taiwan and some sense in China. And I'm going to say, according to my research. It, China opened the door in 1979, right? Exactly the same year, Chinese government actually implemented a document. In that document, specifically talking about they are going to use special favor type of, you know, whatever, give it to Taiwanese business people to come to China, hope to recruit them to come to China. Because in this document, specifically say, the transition for China to politically integrate Taiwan into part of China, to be part of China, is to use economic force, 
which means they are going to give the special treatments to the business people. And hopefully one day through economic integration, you will come to political integration. And that's exactly the Chinese part is 1977 have official document on this. And that's exactly why Taiwanese are so worried about the trade uh, with China. So this will come to later. We have a panel talking about if Taiwan, this movement right now, this movement, sunflower movement is something just, you know, it's pure, I mean, it's an ideological anti-free trade. Yes and no in some sense. It's here so much also in Taiwan's nationalist about our, you know, sovereignty issue also stuff. So because the China side already set up so much political agenda in uh, its economic uh, integration with Taiwan. So that's something I think I set up at home here. We are facing a huge, huge, powerful country, which is unfortunately, according to Taiwan, it's, it's so close to Taiwan, right? We wish we can swim <laughs> our island a little bit far away. Not only Taiwan, main island, but Jima. You know, if we can swim, we hope we can swim, right? It's so close to. So we are facing China, but we are also facing our business with people and our the KMT party. And people, of course, people wonder why KMT party is so much interested about uh, this, in, you know, working with China. And of course, I think it's a lot of the issues here have been the history from China. So I'm sure they have, a, you know, the the uh, the Chinese sentiment, but also the legitimacy also an issue. Uh, we can, if we have a chance to discuss. But this is something I'm going to say. It's, so uh, from the beginning of this moment, I, I personal, I, I already. Quite sure, my angel is not going to respond to anything. I, I really quite sure because why I think I'm quite sure. According to if you understand the force behind this is transnational capitalist class. Uh, the force is be it's about uh, for instance, if my angel is going to respond to this moment, he pretty much had to change his policy, economic and political policy with China also means China have to change his policy. So this is so much powerful force behind. Also, with, you know, the, the KMT's legitimacy in Taiwan would be, be totally doubt. So from the beginning, I really don't think, you just think about, even after half a million people coming out, I still don't think. Because this is not the first time we have so many people come out. So the definition of success or not succeed in the movements, you can't just see from if the women dies respond. No, I don't think, I, I think, I don't think it is the only Taiwanese issue. Any right now so-called, you know, anti-free trade movements were so trying to fight for social inequality. I think people, we all have to that kind of, face that kind of reality because of the power behind is so great. You can't expect you come out once or twice and then the regime is going to respond to you. No, it's not. So you have to re-injectify yourself and then fight again. And then this is the long term. So that's my thinking. So I have one couple more minutes. I'm going to say the significance of these movements. One is I'm going to think, I think it's so much in internal is really important, you know, because they could, they're all talking about. This basically, democracy is not really in Taiwan yet. It, but never yet somewhere anyway. It's always, democracy is in process. And in Taiwan, this will be long, long process. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is important, part of one big step in this process. It's just in the process. I think that's so important. My, that my, that my angel knows, no, people are watching him. That's why. I think it's also, you know, this is a good way to recruit people to understand people are entitled to. Uh, you know, rights also. But I think also important for China to get to know, uh, it, you know, because of the good, my angel have been kind of been, we have been really friendly with China for long. I'm not saying we can, you know, I, I, I'm not saying we should not unfriendly with China, but I say in policy speaking. So I think it does send a sing, strong signal to, to China. You no, know, Taiwanese are not thinking that way. A lot of Taiwanese are not thinking that way. And also I think it's so important for international society too. Uh, you know, because uh, this the year I'm based in New York, and I noticed so much different from here now and when I was a graduate student here. Uh, I think it's so much people, especially I, I've lot in international s relations study circle, they kind of get an idea about Taiwan's already kind of come part of China. And, and people there are kind of not so much opposed to this. And I think this is a big signal. 
And I think one other thing can connect is, you know, this Taiwan, this movement is not necessarily anti free trade because Taiwanese is so much about trade and business economy, right? So if Taiwan is going to enter free trade, that would be big, I don't know how to say. <laughs> but but I think it's still a lot to be, be able to connect with a lot of outside movements, especially in terms of the enlarge this kind of social inequalities. And I think this is a lot that we can learn from each other and can connect and work together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Wei Yang and Wan Bing Techie setting up. Um, people from the from outside, you can come in and probably, if you don't mind, sitting on the ground. There's some space here for you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, hello, hello, hello. Okay. Before the two slides. Okay, I don't. Okay, how? Just talk loud. Okay, okay, that's that's easy. Before they finish setting up, um, I want to say that uh, today I will be focusing on the uh, on the side of the free trade issue or the neoliberalism or globalization, which I hadn't had much chance to talk about in the few past few days. So today, um, I'm not a spokesperson of the Sunflower Movement. I'm just a student ac activist. So this is the opinion of mine, not the <laughs> movement, because um, the Sunflower Movement um, has, uh, has never, uh, the, the free trade has never been a main topic or issues. Um, during the movement, and uh, but it is one of them, and but it's not the main discourse. So, okay, this is the PowerPoint that I had, I had in Taiwan uh, for a, a, an occasion. This from two thousand people to half a million, and, and that's not important. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. Okay. Okay. So I will just skip it. This is the activity that we had uh, before, and. Uh, I think everybody knows about ECFA, so the uh, service trade agreement is uh, under the framework of, of ECFA, so I just skip that. Is and the four form of the uh, service trade agreement is uh, as listed, cross-border trade, consumption abroad, uh, commercial presence, presence of natural person, well it's not just, it's just not, important, not important, just remember a lot of, a lot of capitals, labors, or well, not laborers, they say they are, they call it bosses or come to Taiwan and um, capitals can be invested uh, um, up to 50% or something. Or, yeah, so it's just, I would skip that. Uh, it's difficult. I think, the, okay, I just said next. Next. Okay, just skip all that, skip all that, and skip, skip, skip. <laughs> this, because I will, if you want, I will give this. Um, PowerPoint. Okay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> go back. <laughs> Sorry, go back. Yes. At least, okay. I'm talking about the um, some dimensions, or we can um, we can see in the uh, service trade agreement. First is the China factor, just like um, my teacher Shen said about. It's about the uh, uh, sovereignty of Taiwan, or uh, whether or not if we sign or we pass this agreement, our freedom of speech will be affected. Or um, will this benefit the cross strait politician or inter, uh, international uh, uh, international capitalist alliance, which just benefit them and not uh, to the uh, to ordinary people? And uh, another side is the economic justice, which um, we talk about uh, how, how what is the impact on industry um, during the whole deregulation process, and uh, uh, can we reach the class justice? And we want to break the myth of the free trade. And another side, of course, is the pressure justice. We talk about black box, black black box operation, and then the lack of monetary system, and the no impact assessments. And the, the last one is the form and the content of the agreement. Well, for example, some economics says, well, this is not, this is just not a good free trade agreement because we, because they are not open opening up enough, and we are opening up too much. It's not equal. But um, 
this this side of uh, discussion is not um, too much during this uh, uh, movement. It's mo mainly about uh, procedural justice and the China factor. And today I'm trying to uh, focus more on the economic justice and next. And this is just China factor, and I not intend to do that in today. Past, past, next, 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 next. Okay, also, um, what's behind uh, uh, the whole service trade agreement is the concept, or not concept, the practice of free trade. So you can see free trade, and I, inte I, well, I, I don't like the term free trade that much because it sounds good. And, uh, <laughs> well, well, maybe it's, it's good, but just, we, we need to, uh, I, I, I like to use another term called deregulation. And, uh, well, that's just one part of the free trade I know. <laughs> and so with China, that's the ECFA framework, and you can see the service trade agreement, or later on will be the, the, uh, the trade agreement in goods. And uh, with other countries, we have FTA and uh, um, TPP or RCEP. So, well, we are, Taiwan is now on, on the, the, the free trade is the agenda of Taiwan now, so you can see the President Ma ying wants Taiwan to be an island of freedom, which he, he, he meant island of free trade. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I want to, uh, to, def def to define the, the term of free trade. In my perspective, I, I, I see that in the way of deregulation, which means uh, in the international or regional um, trade um, trade uh, trade acti act activities, we try to they try to reduce all kinds of um, trade barriers to uh, uh, to improve the um, mobility of goods or um, labor force or capitals and such uh, um, uh, product pro 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 produce uh, factors. So so those f uh, trade barrier include tariff barrier or non-tariff barrier, I, I believe you all are aware of that. So we try to lower the tariff or we, we, uh, we want to eliminate all the quota control or we, there, there can be no license sub, um, subsidies or something. It just needs to eliminate all the uh, trade barriers. And also, um, uh, under the agenda of free trade, uh, the laws of um, er environmental protection or the laws of um, labor protection or the laws, the laws of um, the land uh, appropriation, they have to be loosened so that it won't be a barrier to the trade. So <laughs> you can see that this is a very big, uh, big, big picture. So it's not just about service trade, it's about the whole um, landscape of our ways of life. Okay, next. So. The service trade agreement is just one part of the whole agenda of deregulation. Why, why is that? Because the service trade agreement will just, um, they, they allow Chinese uh, capital or um, workers or capitalists to, um, um, to, uh, to come to Taiwan with little limits. And they, they also allow Chinese capitalists to control the transportation, warehouse, or logistics. So uh, um, if we pass this agreement and, uh, and later on we pass the uh, uh, trade, trade agreement in goods, then it will become like Taiwan and then China will, the, the, the uh, labor force, the capitalist, and the, the goods, and the, the material, and the like, capital, all those um, pr 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 produce um, uh, essence to produce will become they can freely move around between Taiwan and China, and the, which is the whole spirit of free trade. So this is, you know, if you know there will be a uh, um, the free trade economy um, zone and, uh, in Taiwan. So we will just, um, on this agenda, Taiwan will just increase our dependence on China and uh, also increase the um, degree of uh, deregulation. Yeah, and next. But, but this is not a new thing, or shall I say, this is not the medicine to solve the problem of Taiwan's economy. Why? Because Taiwan has already been on the process of um, deregulization. You can see that in 1970s, we already um, tried to lower our tariff rate. And uh, um, from now on, and uh, next, next, 
So you can see this is the percentage of the tariff that is um, in our net, net text. So um, in 1970s, there is up to 30%. Uh, that means tariff, 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 right? Tariff is a tariff is a major, major has a major proportion in our um, taxes text. But in in uh, 2010 or something, they'll just drop to um, nearly four percent. So this is a process that we already we are we were already on. So next, but uh, what what is the uh, outcome of this process? We can say that the deregulation can can be said is the um, benefit to the big corporation and uh, bad things for the labor. Because if we see that the primary distribution of GDP, and uh, you can see the um, uh, compensation of employees and the net indirect taxes is just dropping, and uh, the uh, operational operation surplus is uh, is rising, which means the the government and the the labor is. Uh, they gain little um, during this process, the whole process. What and uh, those who um, get the benefit are the um, business, big businesses. So and uh, um, another thing is the index of unit output labor cost of employees and uh, the index of labor productivity, uh, which means um, uh, the, the uh, next there is the uh, 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 yeah. So you can see the the green one is. Uh, is the um, which simply um, to put it simply is the the in GDP how much how much is go going back to the empl empl em employers to the workers to the laborers well there were it, it was about around fifty percent but it now dropped to the forty nine and then the purple line here was the uh, is the surplus of the uh, business so it rise from seventy percent to uh, uh, about around 74, 73 percent. So it was, it's not that much, but compared to what the labor uh, or say the uh, the employers is just well, yeah, you know, you got what you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yes, and the the blue one, which is the, the the this one, is the how much the state, how much the government will gain from the um, well, GDP from taxes fr from tax from tariff, something like that. So, well, this trend just shows how um, the big picture is uh, in Taiwan. Next. And this is the, this one, the, the orange one is the product, the index of uh, labor productivity, which means Taiwanese labor is very productive. You can see <laughs> the, the line is raising. And the, the, green, the green line is how much um, the employee is going to pay for each unit of pro productivity, uh, which you can just um, imagine it as wages or something, so it can it just dropped, and, and meanwhile this is the, is the productivity is ri is rising. So um, I just put it this way: the the harvest of uh, the the what what the laborers or the workers have worked so hard and to. Um, to um, to increase our GDP just didn't come back to them and just goes to the to the big business. Okay, next. Oh, so oh, uh, go back, go back, and not, uh, another one. Go back. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is um, under the um, uh, economic liberal liberalization and deregulation or what something whatever you want to call it, the industry facing. Um, Tremendous competition pressures. That is what is going to happen when the service trade agreement is passed. So, in, under the circumstances, the minority, the, the minority of the labor force will become the first one to be to be cut or to be sacrificed. So, we can see that during Taiwan's history of economic development, a lot of um, factories they just shut down or moved to overseas, just like um, my uh, uh, <laughs> uh, teacher Shen says. And uh, or to send away to dismiss the laborers or pay, uh, or back pay um, or yeah and the, like um, part time job increases okay and uh, our real wages just stop um, in for fifteen years and the other on the, on the other side the country uh, the st the government they 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 use something called um, statute for the encouragement of investment or. Uh, the status of upgrading industry, which, 
which, uh, oh, which means to um, lower the, the uh, tax rate or um, give them um, money to, uh, to, to try to, to, to uh, give an incentive to the business, business to invest in Taiwan. But this didn't help much um, to uh, help Taiwan's economy much because they just get the money or they pay less tax and still move to other to move overseas and or they will they won't actually upgrade their uh, their their technologies they just um, yeah they, they there's not 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 actual upgrade during the whole period but the uh, the wage earners they have to bear more and more um, tax um, tax tax um, yeah and it's out of proportion okay next 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 so what what's what's the impact of service trade agreement to Taiwanese teenager? Okay, we can see there's a trend uh, from 1980s to, uh, to uh, from now the the proportion of uh, the uh, service trade ser service industry is just rising and uh, um, it's now about 70 percent of our GDP and 60 percent of our population. And uh, in this in this industry in 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 the service tra service industry, there. Um, the accommodation and the catering business and the, the wholesale and the retail trade is add up to 48 percent, and the, their average real wa real wage in 2012 is less than um, for so what is it? forty thousand dollar in Taiwanese uh, Taipei, uh, which is less than about fifteen. Okay, I know. Do that. I don't do that math. I, I'm I'm not good in math. Yeah, well, it's, it's just not 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 that much. And the financial business, the uh, information and communication, or the science or the technology um, set service, um, they are just about twenty percent of the uh, of the industry. But their average real wage is about six or seven. Um, <laughs> Yo, so, so this is uh, so you can see that if we open this market, or well, yeah, there will be um, there will be business who have the benefit, or maybe a. I'm on your side, so let me explain one thing. Is okay. He is talking about uh, the average income of Taiwanese, which is three times higher than the average income of Chinese people, and the treaty was involved of our Taiwanese job opportunity about seven million people. And Chinese GDP is uh, 10 times higher than the Taiwanese GDP. Taiwan, uh, Ch China's GDP is world number one, and Taiwan's the number seven. But in the meantime, our average income is three times higher than the Chi Chinese people. And we are signing the service treaty involving seven million of our people to, you can see our income is already three times higher than them. And Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, okay. Well, what I'm trying to say here is that inside Taiwan, in just inside the uh, Department of Service uh, Industry, there are it is not this not one is is several. You, you can see you have to see the diversities and the, some of the uh, uh, industries are just they they are they are they are. Um, Vulnerable to the impact, or they are vulnerable to the opening up. So we have to consider. We have to have consideration on those, um, um, on those, for example, accommodation or catering business. And of course, the the financial information they will have benefit. But I think the whole point to rethink the uh, concept of free trade is how much, to what degree, to what content we are going to sacrifice our minority to, to um, give the benefit to. To the um, to the one percent five percent yes I think that's the that's the concept and just very quick I um, mean um, uh, two um, two thousand and twelve or there is a um, there is a survey on the teenager uh, or young people's uh, uh, jobs category and uh, there are fifty seven percent young young people are in the service trade uh, industry and the, the uh, most Largest proportion will still be on the um, wholesale and the retail trade, and about uh, thirty percent. The average wage uh, is uh, below um, thirty thousand dollars, and also Taiwan, the, um, the uh, service 
service industry in Taiwan are, are mainly medium or small um, business, and um, when it's opened up and facing the big corporation, big state, capitalist, China, big, big business, you'll just be overwhelmed, and this the 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 cost of competition might just transfer to, um, trans um, just goes to the our uh, young laborers and just causing the. Uh, uh, poverty of our uh, young generation or uh, deepen the uh, class injustice in Taiwan. So we have to think, who, the government just keep talking about the ability to compete, but the, who has the, in, the uh, ability to compete is always th those who already can compete, and those who cannot compete will just be compete away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and next, next. Okay, so this is the probably the last one. You know. We have to think you know, um, in this whole trend of global globalization or the whole press of um, liberalization, free trade. We have to think that what's the cost of, um, of each individuals or each actors or each industries in the in this free trade or liberalizations. You can see among uh, among all the Shenzhen uh, Yao English. Okay. Factors, of factors of factors of production among all factors of production the labor labor force is has the uh, lowest mobility uh, the land can be purchased and switched to other person to other um, corporations so it can shift easily but the labor force cannot move so so with cannot move freely because for example that in Taiwan there is a Guo Dao Shou Fei Yuan that uh, who um, um, charges on the on the Highway, and they were all, and they were they they were dismissed. And the, the big company said, "Okay, you can come to come work to uh, in my company, and uh, we will, you 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 don't worry, you don't have to worry about losing your job." But the technology, uh, the skill that is required, is totally different. So the government always say, "If we open up, we'll create thousands of um, opportunity job opportunities." Um, in the, um, for example, technology department or um, communication service department, but those who open a small or medium um, retail um, or re retail shop, you just cannot go work in the financial department right away. You will cost uh, years of training or retraining. So we have to think that what's the cost or what's the price we have to pay or we can bear during the whole process of liberalization and what's to what extent we, we, we are willing to sacrifice our minority people, our minority friends. So, well, th I, this, is the, this is the issues that hadn't been discussed much during the whole Sunflower Movement, but me personally, I want this dimension um, the, of issues to be widely discussed. I, we, I, I'm not saying that we have to go the way to anti, anti the free trade or we are just shut, we, we just don't sign any trade agreement, but this kind of discussion is neat, and, uh, and uh, it's good for the uh, the good for Taiwan. And uh, the whole point of the sunflower movement is to have the the due process or have the space for um, uh, citizen deliberation. There there can be more discussion. So with that, we can discuss. We can have this kind of discussion whether or not we are going to. Are we are going on this way, or we can change our course to another direction. So yeah, that's pretty much what I'm going to say today. Thank you. slightly uh, to think about media because I think this movement uh, is really also a media wars, right? We think the first few hours of the occupation, there were live stream that was set up so you can really watch wherever you are to think about you know, what the students are doing inside of Congress. But also, um, a lot of us were organizing overseas. I mean, a lot of uh, attention we're trying to get is through international media. So uh, we're welcoming Ben Hedges, uh, who has been really watching uh, the development of the movement um, in New York. And Ben Hedges is a journalist who reports on t China and Taiwan. He's the host of New Town Dynasty Television's A Foreigner's View of, of China show. Ben is a graduate of the Chinese department at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London in the UK. Ben also spent a significant time in Asia, living in Hong Kong for nine years, and studying Chinese in Taiwan for one year. So let's welcome him. Uh,
Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Ben Hedges, or Hao Yibo. This is my Chinese name. <laughs> and yeah, we do a show called A Foreigner's View of China, and then more recently, A Foreigner's View of Taiwan. Uh, we had to change the name because we didn't want to offend Taiwanese people when we started talking about Taiwan in our show. Um, and uh, so obviously, we've been uh, following this uh, issue and reporting on it quite a lot. And I remember the day that uh, the students, you know, entered the uh, Lifa Yuan, the uh, executive, uh, no, not the, the legislative Yuan. Um, we were actually, I'd been to Taiwan about three weeks before that, and everyone, our show kind of became famous through commentating on soap operas and, and Korean dramas and stuff. So everyone had asked me to report on this show called Lai Zixin Xin De Ni, which is uh, <laughs> So I, I released a yeah I, I released a video on that on the day that all this stuff happened with the uh, legislative yen and uh, I started seeing on Facebook everyone's commenting on saying hey this is great but uh, I don't really have time for this right now you know? <laughs> so and then I look in my inbox and there's hundreds of messages from people saying hey can you tell us what's your view on this this thing that's going on in Taiwan so uh, uh, that was I guess that was a Sunday so I started looking at um, you know all the live streams and started reading Taiwanese media. And then, you know, so, you know, this is a huge thing. It's probably the biggest news story in Taiwan, maybe since uh, Chen Shui-bian's uh, money laundering thing, like, <laughs> four, five, six years ago, I guess 2008, right? So, um, <clears throat> so my producer said to me that, you know, Taiwanese people, uh, yeah, our show is called A Foreigner's View of Taiwan or China. Or um, and so my producer said to me, you know, they want to see, people in Taiwan want to see a, a foreigner's view, you know, so they definitely will be interested in what the, um, the U.S government is saying and what scholars and, and people are saying in the US. Um, and at that time, you know, reading English language news, uh, most of the reports in the Western media were from probably from wire, news wire services like uh, Reuters at the beginning you know, in the first few days because many Western uh, news stations, they don't have reporters in Taiwan, in Taipei. Um, if you're a news outlet, it, it costs you a lot of money, you know, to put a reporter somewhere and, and you know, so you have to make sure that there's regular news coming up every day for that reporter to report on in order to justify it. So, uh, you know, and I served as a reporter in Taiwan for a year, uh, a few years ago, and, you know, I never saw Western reporters. I think I probably saw a Western reporter once. Um, so <clears throat> most of the reports were from freelancers working for wire services at the beginning. And then after a few days, we started to see um, sort of op some opinion pieces uh, written by scholars. Um, but no real significant interviews, and certainly no interviews from high-level U.S. officials. And a few days later, um, one interview came out, which I think was like an amateur journalist who had been to this conference where there were some U.S. congressmen speaking, and he managed to interview two congressmen uh, who spoke, actually you basically spoke in support of the students. But this footage was kind of out of focus, and it was, it was just something that spread virally on YouTube. But actually at that time, for a few days, that was like the highest level person that had been interviewed about this issue. So I was thinking, wow, how do I like cover you know, this and get, try to get something really good? So um, on the Monday, I guess it must have been a week after um, the whole incident um, and a day after the uh, Xing Zheng Yuan um, incident, the executive Yuan, um, Nancy Pelosi, who is a US congresswoman, who's actually, she was the first ever female uh, speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, she came to New York and was actually doing a press conference about um, immigration, something totally unrelated to Taiwan. And, uh, but I went there and I was like, oh, I, I, I got to ask her, her view. So at these press conferences, they always tell you, oh, you can't go off topic. You know, you've got to stay on the topic. And there's always one reporter who, like, asks something completely unrelated. <laughs> we normally look at them like, yeah. but this time I was that reporter. I, I was like, yeah, it's too important. I'm going to ask. So I asked her this. and. Um, I don't know, if anyone's seen my show where she's in it, um, she basically said, why would you, she thinks the students are angry because why would you cooperate with a country that whenever tri Taiwan tries to do anything internationally, they always block it. For example, joining the UN or trying to do anything with international organizations. China's behavior to Taiwan is not exactly friendly. Um, so she thinks, you know, why, why would you want to cooperate with someone like that, a country like that? That's a little bit off the topic of what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about you know how the media are covering it. Um, so <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit. I know I've only got 12 minutes. I've probably got like five minutes left. So um, <laughs> the Western media, um, basically, to sum it up, they 
like I said, they don't really generally have reporters in Taiwan, <coughs> so they, they rely a lot on wire services, and then um, they interview people outside of, of Taiwan to get expert opinion, but it takes a little bit of time for that process to happen. And, um, it's a funny thing, I often read the articles on BBC's website, and they have, um, they almost have like a, a generic paragraph that explains Taiwan's history that I'm, I'm sure that they copy and paste it for every <laughs> single article, you know? It says, after 1949, the Civil War, the two sides split and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's exactly the same every time, uh, to just let people understand. Um, <clears throat> so the Western media, yeah, they, they tend to be a little bit slow when reporting on Taiwan. It's not as, as fast. Unless you go to a kind of specialist, pub, uh, more specialist publication that focus on international relations, that kind of thing. I read in The Diplomat, a very good article by a PhD student who's, who's in Taiwan. Uh, and I looked him up on Twitter and I saw, oh, he's actually following me on Twitter. <laughs> I'm on there as a China journalist and I, I don't really use it very much, so I don't really go on there. But, um, so then I called him up and he, he did an, uh, and interviewed him. And his view was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> but I won't go into that because that's not talking about media. So now I'll talk a little bit about the Taiwanese, um, Taiwanese media. Um, and this incident has really showed, I think you can see, the polarization uh, in, in Taiwanese media. Uh, and, you know, in the West, we really value objectivity in media. Um, so you've got, you know, media outlets, even if they're not objective, they at least try to be objective to, to, for their reputation, you know, like uh, Fox News, which is arguably <laughs> not that objective. But their slogan is fair and balanced. You know, they <laughs> at least want to give off that opinion. Um, but in Taiwan, you know, you have now one extreme is Zhongtian, which yeah. I don't know the English name for that, but they they have been sort of the big kind of like media victim of this. I don't know whether what they're really doing, but um, I think everyone probably has heard about the incidents. One was one of their reporters um, kind of like boasted on Facebook about having kicked some students, and then they later apologized and said, "Oh no, we were just tired, and it was a joke, or something, something like that." Uh, and then they, they had this big thing where two hosts on a show on Zhongtian um, talked about this, this girl who's actually suffering from breast cancer who came to the, the protest site and she said that she's more afraid of the government than she is of cancer. And, you know, she was dressed, you know, she looked quite pretty and, and they, they basically made these jokes about, oh, it's great protesting, you can see beautiful girls. And, um, you know, it, it might have been funny in a different context, but actually, they, you know, this person, it was really very, dis, very distasteful, you know, so. And they, they so the students have, have now basically, like, encouraging people just to, like, boycott Zhongtian, and they've kind of been a big uh, victim of this. So they're at one end, and their view now might be related to what, you know, uh, um, the professor earlier was talking about, you know, the big business elite class, you know, c basically controlling, uh, things influencing the media's view. So then at the other end, the complete other spectrum, you, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have um, publications like Apple Daily and uh, Next TV, which is part of Next Media, it's one group, and Dajiuan um, Shibao and Xintang Yuan Shitai, which I work for. Um, <laughs> just a little product placement in there. Um, <clears throat> And they don't even, you know, they're actually supporting the students and they're so blatant about it that they even change the background on <laughs> their website to a lot of sunflowers, right? Anyone else seen that? <laughs> and so, um, <clears throat> because I went and did an interview on New Ten Dynasty TV and they asked me a question, uh, what do you think of the, this issue? And I was like put on the spot and I was just like, previously I'd been kind of trying to be objective, just having my interviewees pledge their support. But actually, that time I was just like, well, you know, I, I completely agree with them. I think it should go through, yi tiao yi tiao de shen cha. Like, um, um, I don't know how to say that. Yeah. Article by article. Article by article. Yeah, yeah. Article by article investigation, whatever. Um, and then, you know, like the Monday after that, I saw a lot of articles. It's like, oh, Hao Yibo supports the students in Zi Yu Shi Bao and and Ping Guo Ping Guo and a lot of other papers. So I was like, oh, okay. I've kind of like lost my objectivity. I might as well just explain my whole um, viewpoint totally. So I, I wrote an article, an opinion piece for Pingo Ruba for Apple Daily. And they published it. And then the following day, they had a panel, of dis uh, a panel, um, a panel to discuss, oh, does this Westerner really understand? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But the funny thing about their panel was that everyone was on the same side. It was like, normally in the West, we get two people for and two people against, and then they kind of debate. But, um, you know, every, everyone was on the same side. So they kind of show their support. Um, so kind of to sum up, I think, you know, in Taiwan, you see a, a massive, like, polar, two ends of the scales, media who are really kind of, like, taking the government or close to China kind of side and then media who are really unconditionally supporting the students and are totally open about it, aren't even trying to be objective. And I think that as you see more economic interests with China and more media gets bought by, well, maybe they can't directly buy yet, but you know, economically influenced by China, you'll probably get a reaction where the media that does support the, is more supportive of freedom, democracy, and these kind of things will become more extreme and, and it'll move a part in this direction, possibly. Um, so that's, yeah, that's basically my, uh, my talk. And uh, thanks very much for, uh, for coming today. Um, so for the next section, we're situating ourselves in New York City, but so we're trying to think globally. So going back to, you know, the panel idea about anti-globalization and anti-capitalism. So uh, we had the pleasure to inviting uh, Professor Peter Kwong, uh, who's a distinguished professor from Hunter, but also the Graduate Center. And you know he's best known for his works in Chinese American studies and also Chinese politics. So let's welcome him. Originally, I was invited, and I said, I don't belong to this group. And, but I said, well, you know, I should come and see what's going on. Um, but <coughs> basically, um, the reason I come is have very much to do with my own background, right? Um, I um, I graduated from Sida <laughs> Fuzhong, <laughs> and uh, my undergraduate was engineering at Columbia. Uh, the reason I got into engineering is basically like everybody. Uh, <laughs> From, from, from Taiwan those days, you could only study science, otherwise you're nobody. Uh, but then after I graduated engineering, I decided that's not what I want to do. I was interested in politics, so I went into Columbia and got my b degree in political science. Now, but when I was at Columbia, um, I was, it was during a time of radicalism, and uh, uh, Columbia strike, my master essay at that time was Chinese Cultural Revolution and specifically Red Gods. So uh, I spent years reading all these CIA documents <laughs> at Columbia, uh, uh, you know, all these. So I was very, very familiar with student movement. And besides the fact that I myself was very active in the student uh, at that time, I was one of the first Chinese went on to demonstrate against the war, 1965. I mean, as you know, 1968, well, anyway, I was active in the civil rights movement, uh, one of the pioneers in Asian American movement. Um, and um, then I was a leader at the Yu Tai movement. <laughs> so as you can see, I was very much, when I was young, very much a part of the student movement. And at after that, I decided, you know, I have to grow up and uh, decide to uh, become an activist, uh, continue to finish my graduate degree, uh, and working in Chinese communities. And that's what most of my work has been, based on pretty much my activist activities. So anyway, so uh, that <laughs> this is my credential to talk to you. Um, so. Let me just cut short to basically what I'm trying to say is this. We are basically talking about global capital. As the previous professor talked about, it's a transnational capitalist class. We are talking about the existence of a class transnationally. It's not just in the United States, in China, in Taiwan, and everywhere, right? This is a class has been declared war against most of us, right? That um, uh, the, the, the free trade 
agreement signing with China is a manifestation. Basically, they have been declaring war with working people everywhere, step by step, stripping their income, stripping their social welfare, <coughs> stripping their health benefits, stripping public services. All these things is happening. I mean, you know, uh, you live in New York City, you know, rich people gets everything and everybody gets cuts, right? For myself as a faculty, we haven't had a contract for three years. And, um, and anyway, you know this, this is what's going on. So the, the point here is, if that is the case, right, how do we fight back? Right. And uh, here then, I'm going to be very old fashioned about it. <laughs> that the most powerful force that is capable of countering global capital is a internationally connected labor movement ally with small businesses, service people, in the case of Taiwan farmers, right? And, and so if we can build that kind of internationally connected uh, 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 movement, then we have a chance. Otherwise, we're all divided. Everybody said, have all these, uh, uh, their, their own specific interests. Now, <coughs> most people would say, geez, you know, what's the definition of working people, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into that because this gets very complicated, but I'm just trying to say that we are underestimating the role that working people play. We use the term post-industrial, this and that. Somehow, if Taiwan went to post-industrial uh, post or United States going post-industrial, there are no workers left. <laughs> but workers everywhere. It's just that they are, their role is degraded. They are not respected, right? Nobody gives them about them. What, whatever they do, nobody cares. So, you know, when you talk about it, workers' movement is never being considered. And it is a result, logically, global capital has been very, very successfully undermining uh, the, the, the role of working people everywhere. So uh, I'm not going to go through too much of this, but I just think uh, my own experience right, uh, working in Chinese community, particularly working in the last uh, 30 years, uh, mainly on fighting against sweatshops. And today, I'm very much involved in anti-gentrification. These are two connected issues. Uh, they are both uh, affecting the working people the most. So my experience working in Chinese community is that this is, again, uh, a tactic by the global capital. That is to say, for the workers in the United States, right? To undermine the workers, it's outsourcing, right? There's another tactic, introduce immigrants and give them no legal labor <coughs> protection, right? Even better, introduce illegal immigrants or undocumented workers, right? So this is a two-prong attack and making uh, 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 the, the, the labor as United States casualized, degraded, at the same time, uh, bought over co-opted labor leaders. So United States, we have basically a very, very weak, uh, very, very, uh, what's the word? Irreputable organized labor. There are all kinds of movements, all kinds of strikes going on. It's not reported. It is not supported by labor. So this is the case with Chinese community. If you talk about labor in the United States, one of the largest percentage, I mean, not, sorry, I'm using the wrong word, very, very significant of the laboring class in the United States are immigrants. And they are spreading all across the United States. And it's also in Chinese communities. I mean, you know, with Tiger Mom and all that stuff, <laughs> will all you guys go to Ivy League? But nevertheless, 
the question is, oh, significant the population of Asians are working people, people working sweatshops, people working in salon, people delivering food, all right? Now, these are the things traditional unions never was interested. This is going way back 1980s, uh, well, the, this is going way back in the 1930s, and my first book dealing with the 1930s. From that point on, I mean, you know, I mean, ever since, I'm sorry, ever since 19th century, <laughs> organized laborers have been very hostile to immigrants, right? And never, never tried to organize them. So the result ended is Chinese workers have problems. It, they exploited, right? they underpaid, overworked, bad wages, all those things happen, right? Now, organized laborers don't care about them, so then they have to be organized themselves. And this is where we see small independent labor organizations in Asian American communities. This is the case in, in New York, this is the case in San Francisco, this is the case with uh, Filipino workers, farm workers, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what's going on, that there are labor resistance, but we don't know about it. Most of, uh, most of the, what I, in my book, talk about uptown Chinese, don't care, don't know. Many uptown Chinese go to Chinatown, think this place is so filthy. Why can't somebody clean it? And not really realizing these are very, very important communities. These are the people who work, contribute to the American economy, um, and they are not protected. So uh, my point is that um, it is important for all of us to understand whenever there is exploitation, uh, uh, repression, there is going to be resistance. And, and right now, the resistance scattered all over the place. And not right now, resistance happened outside of context. We cannot understand exactly what causes certain outbreak. But my suggestion to you is that ultimately, we have to find a viable way to counter this global capital. And uh, I, the way I see it is that larger and larger uh, proportion of the world should and will understand that they have to fight back. And um, so uh, even though I'm working uh, in the Chinese community, <laughs> small community, but the logic is the same. We need to build a much larger movement not just in the United States, but connected to other places, including Taiwan, including mainland China. One of the things, you know, uh, one of the things about mainland China, there is a heroic labor movement going on. People always say, well, you know, all these rich people, we always talk about them, but all these years, I wrote again and again, and I'm re regular on many, uh, public press, basically, you know, every year there's th tens and thousands of strikes, what they call violent mass events. What are they? Mostly uh, labor strikes. And nobody give credits to that, right? Some of the, uh, some of the finest academic social scientists talk about writing about you know, Chinese workers, they are not class conscious, they're only interested in regionalism, et cetera, et cetera. That's all BS, <laughs> right? I mean, people say, well, you know, in China, if you have one factory strike, but you never go across somewhere else, right? But that's not the case, that, that, uh, that the Honda uh, uh, factory struck in, uh, in Guangdong, changing uh, other places all, all uh, responded, so I think my advice to you, I hope that you will look at my history, maybe you will also go through the same path as you go on, as always I am. <laughs> um, 
but then we, sh we should be moving beyond uh, the questions of outrage, uh, moving beyond this student movement. There's nothing wrong with student. I came from student movement. But we need to go on forward and thinking big. Thank you. He has an um, active interest in language through which he developed his analysis of class, race, and gender. He is currently doing some translation work regarding labor issues and in is interested in um, influence of various oppressive systems in maintaining a global neoliberal order, but not so good at speaking about it. <laughs> Let's welcome him. So uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I really don't like speaking in front of large groups of people. So, um, so uh, thank you, Wen, for having me here today. Um, I guess uh, I, I, I don't have credentials that everybody else has. I'm not an academic, um, and I not directly. I'm not very knowledgeable about the whole. I mean, I've seen a lot of what's going on in Taiwan right now, but I'm not like you know. I'm not in the newspapers reading about it every day. Uh, but I think it's a very exciting work. Um, I think it's very exciting, like a movement. And I was looking at your T-shirt that says, like you know, like the the basically like, what is like officials are forcing the 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 people the people to rebel, right? So I think that's 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 really 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 spot on, in, in the way that um, the uh, global <coughs> neoliberal capitalist order is is, is uh, developing and stuff. So um, so when asked me to talk about a little bit about the local context, so just uh, for y'all's reference, so I, I um, I've been in New York for about four and a half years. Uh, I um, have been volunteering uh, and uh, been on staff at a community-based organization doing tenant organizing work in uh, Chinatown. Um, so, uh, uh, and I've also been involved in other other things uh, locally. So I think it's really interesting. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk about some like big, like capitalist, like global neoliberal stuff like that. You know, uh, I'm not the most eloquent person, um, but uh, hopefully, like you know, I hopefully can. Uh, build some connections with what's going on locally as well. So how many actually, just by show of hands, how many people here live in, uh, who, who, how many people rent uh, an apartment in, in New York City? OK, great. So how many of you all live in a rent-stabilized apartment? Does anybody know what rent-stabilized? OK, one, two. <laughs> OK, who here knows what rent-stabilization is? Can you raise your hand? Yeah. So like very few people know, like, you know, not too many people know about this, and yet like so many people rent to live in, in New York, right? And so rent stabilization, um, so I, I have to talk about this through like my work here and stuff just to hopefully make sense of things. But uh, a lot of these, uh, these rights, these things that we uh, enjoy um, as whether you are here, you know, whether you have like legal rights to be in the U.S. or whether you are a citizen or whatnot, you know, a lot of these things uh, came from movements uh, that were uh, in uh, direct that showed dissent with what happened with, with the existing orders, right? So, um, as Professor Kong was talking about, like uh, gentrification in Chinatown, you know, there there is a big, very there is a big class divide in, in what we in what's going on in New York City in, in just in the, like within the Chinese community, right? So. Um, and I think that it's it's a part of all of this, uh, all of these things that are going on. So uh, one important thing to keep in mind is just how uh, people that are in power, um, they, you know, it's it's part of like the capitalist system is that you are trying to accumulate capital, but you accumulate the capital and in order to maintain your power and influence over everything else, right? So. Um, and this is not only in terms of like I would say that like in addition to just like how uh, capital is a very uh, important force and how um, um, having a united like labor front uh, globally is very important. It's also important to recognize how uh, other systems are also part of this uh, part of this bigger picture idea, right? So you have things um, you have like it's not only about it's not only about like workers, right? You also have like 
what about women's rights, you know, gender rights and gender equality, and what does that really mean in this global context as well, right? So uh, just by show of hands, like how many of you think that like women actually make the, the same pay rate as, as men in the workforce, right? <laughs> no, it's not true. I don't really think it's true either. <laughs> So you know, it, it, it's it's like it's part. It, that's also part of these things. And also, another another very important thing is, if we're talking about a local context in the U.S., I think that you can't talk about this without talking about race as well, right? How many people here identify as a person of color? Okay. So, does anybody want to? Does anyone explain what person of color means? Anybody want to venture that? No? Not white. Huh? Not white. Not white. Right. So in, in the U.S. context, it means not white, right? And so I think it's a very, it's, 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 a, it's a different uh, formation of identity in, in coming to terms of uh, politics in the U.S., right? And because the U.S. is, like, connected globally through these, like, capital networks and everything, and just, and, and politically, um, you have to, under, I think that it's really important to acknowledge how race has had a big influence on colonialism, right, and how that has, that continues to influence um, people worldwide. Um, so I'm really, it's, it's really hard to connect these things that I feel that are really important in terms of like globally and historically and also what's going on locally, right. But in terms of local, like when you talk about like, uh, you know, tenants in, Ch in Chinatown that are being pushed out of their homes, right, so working class Chinese folks that are here to make a living, you know, trying to survive, and like, I mean, sometimes some people like sending money back home to help support people as well, right? When you talk about that, like them getting, getting them getting pushed out of their homes, um, you also t you also hear stories about how this happens because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, so in the '70s you had like white flight, you know, all the white people were like, oh my God, cities are dangerous and dirty, we're leaving, <laughs> right? And then like uh, the doors being closed to people of color in the suburbs, in these other places that were developing because they're not white. Okay, and now you have them coming back and saying like, "Oh, we want to come. We want to live in like Chinatown because it's cool, right? There's a dumpling shop where I can get like dumplings five for one dollar, right?" <laughs> so you have all these like really cool things, and they want to come back and like you know have a part of that, right? And so, but in, but when they do that, you know, what is the uh, what is the cumulative effect, and how does it affect the tenants that live there, right? And how do landlords, as part of this structure of capitalism and like and, and power, what how do they react to that, right? Because they're looking to make more money, right? So for them, it's advantageous to get rid of rent stabilized tenants whose rents are controlled in terms of how much they can uh, uh, raise every year, right? Uh, in order to bring in these white tenants or like more like people like tenants with like more money to live in these apartments and stuff, right? So I think it's it, it and so for for I, but in terms of Chinatown, it's not only about Chinatown, right? Because we see this happening in other places. Does anybody know of like other places in New York where this is happening? Huh? Gentrification. Gentrification. Yeah. So where is gentrification Bushwick. happening? Bushwick. Bushwick, Brooklyn. Okay. Where else? Harlem. Harlem. Okay. Yeah, so all these like communities, right? And these communities are not traditionally white communities, right? Harlem is traditionally like a, a like a black community, um, a, a big like you know Harlem Renaissance, all this like uh, growth of like and development of like um, black culture and stuff, right? And we see these bases of people of color that are being taken apart um, for the you know for for the benefit of landlords and people that are trying to continue to accumulate capital, right? So I think that um, the the, race, the racial dynamics in this is is very important to acknowledge and to figure out and, and really come to terms with in terms of how do we move forward. So it's it is about working class people. It's also about working class people of color, and it's also about women and and in the workforce and what are they making, right? So uh, we also talked. To, we also heard about like how um, certain with, you know the Labor Relations Act and how that was developed in the U.S. What does anybody know like what the Labor Relations Act like which groups are excluded from that? Anybody? The field people and the house workers. Okay, so you have far farm workers and you have uh, uh, workers and in, 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 um, domestic workers, right? Why do you think these two groups are excluded from that? Slaves. Huh? They used to be slaves. Okay, so basically, you had you had a lot of black people in the in these uh, in these sectors of work, right? But o is it only black people? Like farm workers are also not not only black though. Farm workers are also largely. You had a lot of like. Uh, um, South, uh, excuse me, uh, Latino uh, folks that were working in that sector as well, right? So, in terms of labor, there is a lot of racial dynamic in there and racial tension in terms of who gets protection and who does not get protection. Um, so, let's see. Uh, all right, I talked a little bit. You know, so the race and the gender aspect of it is very important to keep in mind as we talk about 
what are we doing in terms of like building like you know uh, uh, a more international movement of like people that are um, invest like, that are trying to uh, fight against the neoliberal order and globalization, right? Um, there is a uh, and sorry, I'm trying to make these transitions in my mind. I was like, oh, it made sense before. So uh, I think I want to go back a little bit now to like the free trade agreements and how um, I think you were talking about how it talks about like freedom and what does that mean, right? So I think actually free trade agreements do mean freedom though, right? They do mean freedom, but who is it freedom for? Capitalists, it's freedom for you know people at the top to make connections with each other so that they can make more money, right? That's what it's. That's what that's what that freedom is, right? So yeah, if you want to talk about freedom, yeah, it is freedom, but it's freedom for a certain specific limited set of people, right? So when I'm talking about when I when I like to talk about freedom and stuff, it's more about like self determination and who are we and who how do we get to decide who we are and how we get to live our lives and everything like that, right? So. Um, uh, I think that uh, when we talk about free trade agreements and stuff, it's always about the top level power holders, power brokers that are trying to get more freedom for them to do what they want to do while this further restricts and limits us, right? You know, we talked about pro productivity raising, you know, U.S. has also seen the same thing, right? Productivity has, has risen by like how much, you know, and yet like we still don't have jobs and we still don't have, you know, people, uh, you know, able to get like, you know, affordable health care and stuff like that. Um, so I think that uh, it's great, and I think that the, the movement in Taiwan is really inspiring for people to get involved. And I hope also that it, it um, gets people, like, I think that international students here, um, maybe like Professor Kwong, who went through this, like, pipeline that was an engineer student and then, like, got involved in, like, local community activism, I hope that it can also um, spur some um, thought about what's going on in our in the places that you're living here. I think that anytime we go someplace and 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 live abroad or wherever, we, we should keep in mind what's going on locally. What how is how are local people being affected and what's going on for them, uh, especially working class people, especially people that are not um, that are that do not have the advantage in power in 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 their in their in their uh, place in society, right? So. I'm gonna end this with just like a little plug because there are a lot of there is a lot of stuff going on in um, in New York uh, in terms of the I think we talked a little bit about like the the you know the Pacific Pivot and like the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement uh, and so uh, there are other there are a lot of like community based organizations that are uh, moving to actually like you know uh, to protest that and to draw attention to that and what that really means, right? Because as we, you know, as we see like labor, like when you go post-industrial, this industrial goes somewhere else, right? And then that continues the, uh, an oppressive system elsewhere, right? And so we continue to like support these things like free trade agreements and stuff like that. We're only just like, you know, shifting things. And also like, you know, we do still have workers in the U.S. If you're a service worker, you're also very like, uh, I know that there's other organizations uh, in New York City that do work with, uh, with, um, with um, service workers, right? So like, uh, there's this new, sh I don't, f I forget the correct terminology for it, but like when you work in like in retail and stuff, you know, it used to be that you could get a regular schedule, but now they want these like flexible schedules and people are forced to take contracts where you just work whenever they tell you to go in there, right? So you can't have a life basically. And yet they're not going to give you all the basic benefits of being a full-time staff, right? You don't get benefits, right? So that's, an, uh, that's like another part of the, you know, these things that are happening locally that also reflect things that are happening globally. So um, on the 13th Sunday, there is a banner making, uh, a banner -making party uh, at Project Reach in Chinatown and, uh, uh, at 39 Eldridge Street. And so uh, what's going on is basically folks in locally are organizing against the TPPA, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, and on, uh, so there's two actions coming up. Um, on the 14th Monday from 3 to 4, they're going to have a Twitter rally online. Um, and then they're using some hashtags. So uh, I can share those later. It's actually very, well, it's very complicated. Huh? Is it in our page? So. Oh, cool. Yes, go look at it. <laughs> and then, uh, and then the last thing is that there's going to be a counter protest to uh, President Obama's visit to the Asia Pacific region uh, in New York City. So on April 25th, um, 6:30 to 8 p.m., uh, look out for that. Um, this is being organized by Bayan USA, Cab Organizing Asian Communities, and No Dutor for Community Development, uh, Korean Community Development. So. Uh, and I think that Wen is going to keep on posting that stuff on the page. But again, I think it's really important for us to think about where we live and then how do we, how do our, how does our own involvement with where we live and always locally based things, uh, a, a reflection of, of our own protest against these more global forces. Thank you.
we have about 20 minutes, and let's just pop up some questions, and <coughs> panelists can decide, you know, if they don't answer in, what, in which way. So, any questions for any of the panelists? We'll take a bunch. Okay, I'll go first. Okay, okay. Okay, um, so hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming, and I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, um, I'm a producer um, in New York, and I, I'm the, one of the um, organizers of Wen and Xin Hui Xu. We, we put together this protest two weeks ago, and we did it twice. And then we, um, honestly, I'm a like a social active activity virgin because it's my first time to participate in this type of activities. But I, I'm pretty sure this sunflower movement is like. Um, raise a lot of people's attention that we are all Taiwanese based in New York, but we, um, we because of Taiwan's recent incident, that we all like came out together um, and to try to do something for Taiwan. So my question for Wei Yang and Yu Fen is, because it, it seems that we have a large um, group of people who are supporting your political point of view or whatever is going on in Taiwan, occupation um, stuff. So for the future, we, we've been seeing hearing a lot of recap about the activity, and we all read about a lot of articles online. So the next step, so what can we do to help you guys for this like continuing activities globally um, to help you guys in, you know, in any, kind, in any kind of ways. Um, you can just feel free to talk to us and, and let us know what, what else we can do for you guys. So we'll take two more questions, and, yeah. uh, and they can think about how to respond to that big question, right? Yeah. So any other <coughs> comments? Can, can I have? Yeah. Uh, I'm Peter Chiao. I'm on the faculty of King Graduate Center. Mm -hmm. And I feel guilty if I don't come here today. You know. <laughs> this, is, this is a spring break for me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, start, uh, make a long story short. Start with the ECFA. I have been writing so many articles, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, actually, you know, I was pushed by many people say to put all those things all together. So there's a book, uh, 2012. The question that we are mentioned about the fact of national identity and economic interest. All right, if Google Peter Chow and uh, Amazon.com, and then you will find that book. Okay. All those questions are well covered. Right? National identity and economic interest specifically report to Taiwan. And then uh, last year, right, 2013, there's a book on economic integration across the Taiwan Strait. Economic integration across Taiwan Strait. Now, I didn't write all those chapters because the first book is interdisciplinary. So I invite many uh, my professional friends knowledgeable about Taiwan, they contribute to various experts. Even on the book on economic integration, I call the Taiwan Strait. I also invite some of the people. So we have a chapter on the high tech, on the financial industry, and even the stock market. How when the, when the, when, when China and the Taiwan <coughs> become integrate all together. You, you won't read those books because some of, uh, some of those articles are very technical. But the concluding chapter is what I say, all right? And make a long story short, so you don't have to read the book. But if Taiwan join, integrate, if Taiwan becomes integrated with China, Taiwan will join China, open, Chinese open, China's open, economically in the short term, politically in the long term, period, okay? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, one more, one more. One more. <laughs> about the future. About the future. About the future. No, this is good for you, you, you students. About the future to fight. You want to fight the big financial company, capitalist. Has to be continued. You read the James Buchanan's book, Public Choice Theory. Big company always win. Social group always fail. So one day, you know, sunflower will come out. I was very excited. I said, maybe Taiwan's sunflower movement will prove Buchanan's theory as wrong. Who is Buchanan? He's a Nobel laureate in economics. Okay? And his famous is public choice theory. His theory is that government make a policy not based on the public interest, but based on the campaign, campaign contribution. Where the money comes from, their policy will target them. Period. Thank you. Maybe Ben can talk a little bit about um, how 
the international community is maybe um, revising its ideas about the relationship between Taiwan and China after this incident because I think those of us who are Taiwanese know that this is not just about free trade or globalization. This is also about a discussion about Taiwan's sovereignty that is immersion that is emerging um, through this whole movement. So I was hoping, and the reason I'm asking is because I came to New York five years ago, I was, and I was so surprised when I came here, when I'm talking to people, that everyone that I talked to assumed that we, just, we would eventually unify. Right? Everybody that I talked to. And that was not something that I knew when I was in Taiwan. And I'm just wondering whether um, you see a change going on um, in the international opinion of Taiwan right now. So we have a couple questions about uh, global strategies and also national identity. So, um, would you like to? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, let me stand here. Uh, the the how, what can uh, what can you do in America to help the movement going on? I, I I think I think the best way for because since we are here mostly students, so I just uh, speak of what can students do in America or young generation do in America. I think that we can gather up and uh, start um, get to know about more Taiwan, Taiwan um, polit pop political or social issues um, happening back there because um, the information I seems to be um, not equal because when I come to America a lot of people ask a lot uh, mis there, uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings about what happened in Taiwan so I think maybe we can build a bridge that uh, th there is a group in America discussing or um, um, about the issues happening in Taiwan. We can then uh, back in Taiwan there can be a group of people sharing information and uh, um, cross um, 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 has some cross sea discussions happening. And uh, and uh, by that we I th I, I was I'm hoping that there here in here we can have something um, we have come up with something that can affect the media in America or the opinions of in, in America that. Uh, we can clarify misunderstanding that um, that Americans hold toward Taiwan. For example, that uh, we really um, talking about the uh, nat uh, national sovereignty. That Taiwan really don't want to be unified with China. So we we want the American media or one of the American new, uh, opinion to know about that. So I think we can get up and have some discussion. Come up with a solution. Come come up with a plan, and we can. Um, um, show that show the media, show the American um, government that Taiwanese determination. What what is our uh, will to uh, to s s uh, stay or protect the way of our life? So I think to be to to be to to sum up that is I, I think Taiwanese student in America has to be organized and it has to and it has to uh, discuss issues happening in Taiwan and we can and we should build a connection with uh, students, with the young generation or act, uh, activists in Taiwan. When the bridge is built, I think it's, what, what do you want to? No, Okay. <laughs> 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 就是一起討論你們共同在比如說在紐約遇到的去關心在台灣發生的一些有點太遠了我們有一群人開始在組織是不是因為過去台灣就是很少有那個全國性的學生的串聯但是我們現在正準備開始起來做那我想這件事情一樣可以發生在紐約一樣可以發生在美國對嗯Very briefly I think Yuvan was saying uh, in New York what we can do is really have collective discussions so the movement in Taiwan is beyond the trade pack right and it's about uh, Taiwan as a nation and its future 
So what we can do, um, you know, as students or you know, citizen wherever in, in the states, is really to build sort of a cross coalition movement. I mean, it's not just about free trade, but also about gender issues, about social policies, etc. Right in um, in in New York. <laughs> you know, saying that the President Ma right, really cares about international media and you know, his reputation here, so it's a way that we can probably build movement around against <laughs> President Ma. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the question about nationalism, uh, you know, uh, whether China, whether Taiwan is already assumed to be part of China is a really very, very complicated, important issue to discuss. But I think that the very fact there is a student movement is basically saying, wait a minute, all right? The, 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 the general argument is that first have economic integration, then will automatically lead to political integration. That's what's going on in, in Europe. You have this EU, which is basically economic integration now they realize if they want to have full economic uh, integration, they have to have, uh, uh, countries have to lose their sovereignty. So I think the, the very fact there is such a student movement bring out this issue that that is, we don't want necessarily want to go down that path, right? So I think that's the significant to me uh, about this, this particular movement. Now on the long term, there's a lot more complicated issues. And that is to say, um, you know, I'm from Taiwan. Uh, when I was a kid, Chang you know, you have the you have the Chinese map, and then you have a tiny little Taiwan. Always talk about talk about Fangong Da Lu, all these things. These are all political things that's very very ambiguous, you know. Um, so uh, there's all kinds of differentiation. But the main point to me. And I think this is the most important thing, is that Taiwan does have a very significant percentage of the population do not want to be part of mainland. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who believe eventually they want, but there's a part. So I think this, this is where the de democracy, the, the strength of your democracy uh, is going to be very, very uh, important. And, and again, this, this event shows the democratic structure of Taiwan is defective. Right, because you have a very significant po a population do not agree with this, and they they outvote it. So, so these are the things that all brought out. Yeah. Um, who asked me the question? So can you just repeat the exact? <laughs> <laughs> I was just hoping um, maybe you could talk a little bit about your observations about yeah. whether the international community is revising its ideas. Okay. Yeah. Um, well. You know, all the, all the people I interviewed, all the professors and the stuff in the process of making the shows about this issue, they all concluded the same as, as Jesus talked about, that you know, China is just using economic integration to pull Taiwan in a mill that will eventually lead to uh, political integration. And it's no secret, China is very open about it. You know, it's, it's pulling Taiwan in lots of implications. Trouble is, in the West, the, you know, in Obama won't speak about Taiwan like he does about Ukraine because the U.S. doesn't have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. So most of what you can get is from lower level uh, government employees or uh, employees, but uh, uh, congressmen, and, uh, or particularly people who are not in power at that time are more willing to speak about um, certain issues about Taiwan. Uh, it's in the U.S. It's in, with China becoming more powerful and the U.S. Uh, switch uh, military switch to the Pacific. Uh, it is in the U.S.'s interest to maintain, uh, you know, relations, relations with Taiwan and a strong, you know, military presence in the, in the Pacific. They talk about a chain of islands which blocks uh, China from, you know, coming across to the U.S. and Taiwan is part of that. Uh, Japan, Okinawa, and down through Taiwan. Um, sometimes I, I question whether the U.S. You know, because Taiwan is obviously one of the two major flashpoints in Asia, one of being North Korea, and the other is Taiwan, where the U.S. could get into a serious conflict with mainland China. So sometimes I question whether does the U.S. government think 
that this economic integration, they will just see Taiwan slowly integrate with, um, with China, and they won't have to deal with a war or some kind of big conflict. Um, but I, I don't think that, uh, you know, although the US is being very careful, it doesn't want to offend China because they're doing a lot of you know, policy. Everyone knows they're doing a lot of business with China right now. Um, um, but we still see things like the uh, F-16 upgrade. People were scared that it was going to get canceled for a while, but I just read yesterday it is going to go through, you know. So I, I think, and then what people who aren't in high positions of power are saying, who are still connected to the government, is that they have, they're voicing a lot of support for Taiwan, like the Nancy Pelosi and the two congressmen that were interviewed in the, the video I talked about. They were really full on in support of Taiwan. And then just uh, in Washington, uh, two days ago, was it Thursday, uh, there was a, a hearing where they talked about the U.S. You know, wants to support Taiwan getting into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I do think the U.S. supports Taiwan, but because they don't have diplomatic relations, they're very quiet about it, and they won't. It's not like when Obama talks about Ukraine, he very publicly, you know, warns Russia and this kind of thing. It's not going to be like that over Taiwan and China. It's kind of like a chess game. It's kind of like quietly communicating there. So uh, is that does that kind of answer your question? Sort of. Um, so we're told that they have to be on the cab by uh, 12.45. So, so thank you everyone for coming here. Um, and also thank you for Papa's sponsorship and also TSA at the GC for the space. Um, thank you for a great talk. And also there's food and coffee. Please eat them and drink them.